Hello, everyone, and welcome to Julia Hub's webinar, What's New in Julia 1.9. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Misha St. Amand. I'm the Director of Marketing for Julia Hub, and I'm pleased to be here, be here with Dr. Jeff Bizanson, um, who is co founder and CTO of Julia Hub. Jeff is co creator of the Julia Programming Language, which earned him and his co creators the J.H. Wilkinson Prize. He earned his doctorate at MIT, and as I'm sure you know, he will be sharing everything new in 1.9 with us today. So, Jeff, I'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Good to have you all here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about the upcoming uh, Julia release. Uh, you know, there was, there was a time when I just knew everything that was happening in the Julia world and could probably just tell you off the top of my head, but... Um, the pace has become really furious, and I can't really do that anymore, and I have to kind of prepare these things. Uh, but first, uh, before I get into that, uh, just a little bit about what we do at Julia Hub. Uh, so basically, here we develop things at kind of three levels of abstraction, uh, if you will. Uh, so the bottom layer there is the, the Julia language and open source community, uh, where we do a lot of the development work, although not all of it, of course. Uh, and as you might guess, that's where I spend most of my time. Uh, and then we also developed Julia Hub, uh, which is a cloud computing platform, uh, which is a place where you can you can run Julia, you can run uh, VS Code IDE, Pluto Notebooks, um, and request on demand GPU machines, uh, clusters of machines uh, for when you need to scale up, uh, and you can do that easily. Uh, I will actually, unfortunately, I will not be using Julia Hub today because it does not have Julia 1.9 yet, uh, because it hasn't been released yet, uh, but it will it will have it available uh, very soon after it's actually released. Uh, but otherwise, I would, I'd be using Julia Hub uh, to do this today. There's going to be a small demo. Um, and then the main thing we use Julia Hub for is, is as a platform to offer uh, applications uh, for specific uh, areas. So we've got Pumas for pharma simulation. Uh, Julia Sim for simulating physical systems uh, and upcoming Cedar for circuit simulation. Uh, and they're also, uh, it's also a platform that people use to develop uh, their private in house packages uh, and customer specific apps. And eventually we hope to have a, a marketplace as well of, of third party applications on the platform as well. All right, but today we're just going to talk about uh, Julia. All right, so there's a lot of new things uh, in Julia 1.9. Uh, the, there is no particular theme to the release because the, the way we do releases, uh, we just release whatever happens to be ready at the time. Um, and uh, so this time there's not, uh, not really a lot in the way of what you'd think of as like language features, like new things that you can type. There's a, it's a lot of kind of infrastructure and uh, ecosystem sort of related things uh, and, and work related to kind of deployment and compiling and compilation artifacts uh, has been and, and packages has been where a, a lot of the focus is recently. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, package extensions uh, and native code caching for packages, which speeds up load times, uh, and some ways to build smaller system images, uh, and a nifty uh, heap snapshot tool uh, that we have, uh, and some threading related improvements, uh, both for native thread interop uh, and some scheduler improvement uh, for interactive threads. All right, so first, uh, package extensions. So one thing Julia really excels at is composability. So everything we have, we try to make it all work together. Uh, so for example, here we've got the plotting package and the units package, and you can, you can load them both and then just try to plot an array of meters per second and just magically, the plot will automatically be labeled uh, with the meters per second unit on the y-axis. So somebody made these things work together, uh, which is really neat. And that's that's worked for quite a while. And of course, that's uh, you know, that's enabled by the language design because you can externally add a method that says, okay, here's how you plot a thing with units uh, because of multiple dispatch. Uh, so that's something that's possible in, in the language and, and really uh, very natural to do. Um, but there's a small kind of organizational problem with that, uh, which is where do you put that code? Because you could put it with plots or you could put it with units, 
Uh, but the, you know, the method that you're writing to do that has to mention both plotting and units. Uh, but it doesn't really make sense for the plot package to load the unit package or the other way around, uh, because you might just be plotting things and not using units, or you might be using units and not making plots. Uh, so, you know, one does not naturally depend on the other. Um, so where do you put this code to sort of, you know, put, lose them together, uh, even though you might only be using one or the other? Uh, and so this was kind of an awkward uh, situation we've been in for a while, and people did various things. We had kind of some hacks and workarounds, uh, and, and we also tended to have kind of too dense uh, a package dependency graph, uh, because sometimes people would just, you know, have depend on everything that they, they could have this glue code for. So you'd end up loading sort of more packages than necessary. Uh, but now in this version, we have a really, really good solution to this. I think it's the right way to do it, uh, where we have an explicit feature for package extensions, uh, where you can, what you do is you in, in your project.toml. So in this case, this is in the repository uh, for the plots package. Uh, so Notably, it's part of the same repository as plots, uh, but it's not part of the package. So you can actually now uh, have multiple packages in the same Git repository, uh, which can be handy for uh, synchronizing development. Uh, but so that's that's partly how this works. So what you do in your in your project.toml uh, for plots is you just have, there's an, there's a section for extensions, uh, and we say basically when a unitful is available, use this unitful ext. Uh, and what that will do is if, if you're in an environment where the user has loaded both plots and unitful, we will then automatically load this uh, unitful extension file, uh, which is in here. Uh, so this is a much better way to organize it, uh, and it means you don't necessarily need to load code that you might not be using. Uh, so this will, I think, over time, this will help uh, some of the startup time and, uh, you know, image size issues as well as that uh, those dependency graphs get Kind of uh, thinned out and things more things get switched to this new extension system. Uh, so I really like this because this is this solves a problem that's been around for years. Oh, and by the way, uh, and if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, you can you can ask questions in the the text chat, and uh, Misha will keep an eye on that and and read them. So Jeff, we have a question for you to answer, which are what okay. are the plan? What are the plans for the GC and Julia, e.g., parallelization? Uh, parallelization, parameters tuning, or maybe even custom GC support? What is the milestone? Uh, yeah, there, there actually has been a lot of uh, GC work recently. Uh, I, did, I didn't put it in this deck because there isn't, uh, there isn't anything really super amazing that, that I can show, but there has been a lot of work on it. Uh, there's been a lot of work on parallel marking. Uh, so that's, that's kind of ongoing. Uh, so I think, yeah, maybe pretty, pretty soon we'll see some better, uh, better parallel GC performance, I think, yeah. There's, there's been a lot of work on that. Okay, next. I think for, for many people, this will be the most exciting and useful thing uh, in the release. So just some timings here. Um, when you start up and after pre-compiling, so this, this is assuming you have, uh, you've set up your environment and you pre-compiled all of your packages. Uh, in 1.8, here are the times for loading plots, which is just our sort of standard startup time benchmark, because uh, there's a lot of code in there. And so you can see it takes used to take four seconds to load the package, and then four seconds to actually display the first plot, which does kind of leave you drumming your fingers on the desk. Uh, in 1.9, the using time is down to two seconds, and the time to the first plot is 0.2 seconds, so an enormous speed up. Um, in the first case, the four seconds to two seconds, this is basically just uh, data structure and algorithm improvements, uh, just organizing the stuff in the, in the packages better so it can be loaded more quickly. Uh, and then in the case of the first plot, we just uh, we're able to save native code uh, for packages so we don't have to compile it the first time. And so this gives a really large speed up here. And you can see in, in 1.8, uh, it was 99.5% compilation time. So basically all all of that four seconds was, was compile time. Uh, oh, and by the way, actually another new feature here is that when you time things, we uh, we still say the compilation time, but we also split out how much of it was recompilation uh, due to code being invalidated by new method definitions and us having to, uh, having to recompile things. Uh, so if you're developing a package and you have long startup times, that can help uh, debug sometimes what's going on. Like is, is 
Um, do I need to have just more things pre-compiled or are lots of things actually getting invalidated and thrown out? You know, which, which is the problem that, uh, that I have if you're trying to really optimize startup time. So the way this works, if we just look into the, uh, your .julia uh, compiled directory, uh, you can see if you look uh, for the plots, um, the plots code in 1.8, we have this .ji file uh, with this kind of meaningless name. This is not, these are not normally uh, user facing. This is kind of a cache that we keep uh, of package code. So that we had this file in our own kind of serialized format that just has the uh, Julia IR and uh, data for the package. Um, whereas now, if you look at it, uh, there's still a JI file that has a little bit of metadata, uh, but mostly we have a .so, which is a native uh, shared object, which has native code in it. And also it's bigger because we have the same stuff we had before, plus we have native code in there. Um, so this is another, you know, really nice improvement. It's been a long time coming. Uh, it really helps cut down that uh, initial latency the first time you do something, which is one of the really big, you know, nuisances people have. So this is a great, uh, great improvement to see. I've been enjoying it myself. All right. And if you're interested in... Uh, these kinds of uh, built artifacts and uh, compiling packages and that sort of thing. Uh, this is another thing I'd like to point out. So like, technically these features were added in 1.8, uh, but I think a lot of people don't know about them. So I'm, I'm mentioning it here uh, as well, uh, which is uh, when you build a system image. So here I used a uh, package compiler, create sysimage to make kind of the, the minimal uh, system image that I could. So this is with no standard libraries, no other packages or anything, basically just the base code. And if you build that, you get about, so that's about 68 megabytes uh, that it takes. Uh, but now you can pass uh, this dash dash strip metadata argument to the build, uh, which will remove things like uh, doc strings and variable names uh, and uh, source location information. Uh, so if you are deploying something uh, onto a machine uh, where you want to strip down the size as much as possible and you want to, you know, hide things like your documentation, uh, if you don't want that to be visible in the in the file you're shipping, uh, you can you can do that. And then that cuts it down to about 55 megabytes. Uh, and there is also the option to strip the Julia IR, which is so that's our compiler's intermediate representation uh, of Julia code. Uh, which and so if you have everything compiled to native code, you don't need that anymore. Uh, so now we have the option to remove all of that, and then that takes you down to 43 megabytes. So overall, that's a that's a pretty good savings. Um, so it, we are we are gradually getting to the point where we can have uh, more uh, kind of reasonable size compiled artifacts closer to what you'd expect from say you know compiling a C++ program. Um, and so we are we are gradually getting there, and there there's going to be a lot more stuff done uh, in that category. So there there are a lot of more ways we can make these uh, built images even smaller. Uh, we're going to try to do some so-called uh, tree shaking, or you know, going through and removing the code that's not used at all uh, by doing some analysis. Um, we are also working on the ability to load basically multiple system images, so you can have uh, separate portions of your project. Uh, compiled to, to different system images, and then you can kind of mix and match and load them all into, into the same environment, which gives you more of kind of a separate compilation uh, sort of workflow. So that, that's not quite ready uh, for release yet, but that's something that's, that's well underway. Uh, and the static compiler package, uh, if you know about that, uh, which is also involved in generating these uh, built artifacts, uh, we're working on that. We're, we're also considering uh, you know, a redesign of it to, you know, to do it even better and have it be built in uh, to the to the language. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on on this. This is one of our biggest focuses right now, because uh, this is this is something that kind of, you know, everybody wants. They want smaller binaries. They want to be able to deploy to a wider variety of machines, uh, and they want more of a separate compilation workflow. So this this is a, a very, a very interesting uh, thing to us right now. Jeff, um, can I, here's a Here's the next question. Um, can an extension module have additional dependencies of its own on top of the parent packages dependencies? Yes, I believe it can, yeah. Thanks, that's it. All right, and if you're interested in the sizes of things and uh, memory use, there's another nifty feature. So we've got uh, in the profile, 
standard library. There is now profile.takeheap snapshot, which will write a file in the Chrome DevTools format, and you can then load it into uh, the developer tools in the Chrome browser, and you can browse through your entire uh, heap of objects. So like here, I can see, you know, I've got a code instance, which is a, one of our runtime data structures that keep track of code. And we can just click down through and see the, the object graph. We can see there's the method in there, which seems to be a method of, of the is equal function. Uh, and then we've got some any arrays and some, uh, some byte arrays. Uh, and you can just look through all your objects and we can see how many of each of them there are. So I can see, you know, there's a, there's over 200,000 arrays. So there's, you know, there's a lot of those and you can uh, profile and find out exactly what's going on uh, in your heap and find out what's, what's taking all the space. So this is really cool to have. All right, threads. Uh, threads has been another uh, thing that we're always doing lots of work on. Uh, so one problem we've had uh, is that the Julia runtime is multi-threaded, uh, of course, and has been for quite a while. Uh, and it also supports native interop with C and C++, uh, but the two did not work together. So if you had, uh, so we would have threads inside our runtime, uh, but if you were calling Julia from within a C++ program, uh, and you started some threads of your own, which then tried to call into Julia, it would not work. In fact, this would crash uh, because we need to have our own per thread state set up uh, to handle things like uh, GC and exceptions. Uh, so that state wouldn't be there and you would just get a crash when you tried to run some Julia code. Uh, so that's not a great situation. Uh, but in 1.9, this is fixed. So when you call into a Julia entry point uh, from a thread started in C, say, we now have the ability to uh, basically automatically set up that thread. Uh, and we'll notice that uh, we don't, this thread is not uh, yet known to us, it's not set up. Uh, and we will allocate the thread local data for it and set it up. Uh, and it will it'll be able to run Julia code. Uh, and while you're uh, while you're while it's running in the Julia runtime, it will take part of the normal uh, scheduler and a worker thread pool. So it will become a, an available thread uh, for scheduling Julia tasks. Uh, and it will you know, participate in all of that as normal uh, until you eventually return back out. Uh, and if you, when, you, when you return back out to, to C, then it will, it will stop doing that. So now this uh, interoperates well, and you can have multi-threaded C calling multi-threaded Julia, and it's, it scales and it works. Okay, more thread stuff. So typically, uh, I mean, our, our goal with threads was just to get it working, of course, first, and which is now it's been working for a couple of years. So now we're on to the, you know, tweaking and performance and tuning uh, part of things. Uh, and so in terms of the scheduler, our policy before has basically been, okay, if all the threads are busy, we're happy. We mostly care about throughput. We generally optimize for throughput. Uh, so we figure if all your threads are happily computing away, then okay, we're getting work done, we're making progress, so fine. Uh, but the problem with that, of course, is you might have a thread that wants to be responsive to, uh, you know, react to user events or uh, ping a remote server or something like that. Uh, and we didn't have any ability uh, to have a, a thread that would remain responsive, that we wouldn't tie up with long running computations. You know, if you have a comp uh, compute that takes like 30 minutes or something, we might tie up all your threads with that. Uh, so now there is a feature that, that gets around this. Uh, so you can start uh, Julia with minus T or dash dash threads of N comma M, where N is the number of CPU threads. Uh, well, N, N is the number of normal uh, work pool threads. Uh, and M is the number of interactive threads. And those, uh, the interactive threads will be reserved for basically tasks that need to be responsive. Uh, and there's also minus T auto, uh, which will set up uh, N to be uh, however many CPU threads you have and uh, the default N value is one. So then if you're in uh, that environment, you can do an at spawn uh, with an interactive. So we have a, a hint here for what, uh, what thread pool you wanna use. So currently it can be default or interactive uh, and if you do that, it will go uh, into the, the pool of interactive threads, uh, which are supposed to stay responsive. So I've got a little demo of this. Uh, so something you might use it for is, is monitoring uh, a long-running computation. So if you have 
uh, you know, a compute job that's going to take, uh, you know, an hour or something, you might want to be able to, you know, look in on it and see what's happening. Uh, so I've got a, a demo of a little life cellular automaton that you might try. So the basic shape of the program looks something like this. So I've got the compute task uh, that just spawns a really long loop uh, that does iterations updating the grid. And it just hangs around doing that for a long time. And then I've got a monitoring task. Uh, which I'm going to spawn into the interactive uh, pool. And this just runs forever, waiting some amount of time, and then every so often, so in this case, about uh, every tenth of a second, uh, it will just look at the state of that grid and do a GR, uh, just do a plot of it so we can look at it. So just basically, you know, plot it every tenth of a second uh, to see, see what it looks like. And then we just wait for the, the compute to finish. So got this in a terminal here. Let me see. Okay, uh, Misha, can you see that? Yep, it's visible. Okay, good. So, all right, here's uh, here's the program, so you can see the whole thing. So there's my, uh, basically those loops uh, down there at the bottom that I just showed. Uh, and so currently, if you try to run this and see what happens, it's not very exciting, actually. What's What's going to happen is nothing because uh, basically, the thread we have is just going to get completely tied up doing the compute part, and the monitor just never gets to run. So we'll just we're never going to see anything, uh, and it's not a not a very good demo. It's uh, it just does nothing, and it, it's disappointing. But now you can run this with a. Uh, oops, I meant to do this. Minus t one comma one, and now there is an interactive thread available. And with that, we see this nice window come up, which then shows uh, shows the grid updating every so often. Uh, so you might say, well, you could have just added more threads. Yeah, so if I had just added more normal threads, that might have worked. Uh, but it's it wouldn't have been guaranteed to work because if the computation was doing a, doing something multi-threaded, it still might be using all of your available threads. And so this is why the uh, the reserved interactive thread uh, is really nice, so we can be sure that there's something available to basically respond to events. And so uh, now this works, and you can you can do this kind of thing. So Jeff, will interactive threads affect the responsiveness of Control C when interrupting a multi-threaded function? Uh, that is a good question, uh, and I I don't think so. I think uh, yeah, Control C should pretty much uh, work as as well as well as before. Uh, and it's, you know, which is, which is sometimes honestly not that well, because it is, it's a pretty dicey proposition to control C interrupt something. It, do, it does, it does usually work, uh, but, you know, stop, stopping your program asynchronously at kind of a random point, uh, you, you kind of don't know what's going to happen. It, it doesn't, it doesn't always work great, but it, but this doesn't make it work really any worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, one other thing, is there anything in the student library that's now using the Aspon Interactive? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, I can answer that very quickly. Let's see. I don't think so. I think I think the answer is probably no. Yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah, no, I don't I don't think anything in the standard library uses it. I, I don't believe so. Okay, that's it for questions for now. All right, and that's um, that's about all I've got. I'm happy to take more questions if there are any. Please feel free to put your questions in. Oh. Is there any progress on compiler plugins? Uh, compiler plugins. That is a that is a really tricky one. Yeah, it's very it's very tough to come up with the right API for that because people kind of want to do different things. Um, so uh, the, our approach to that has just been to kind of try to get the compiler extensions that we actually want, like Autodiff, uh, get those working first, and then 
and come back and see if we can abstract after that and figure out you know what API would work for that rather than trying to uh, make something that's generic and handles all cases up front because that's just a, it's a hard design problem. Okay, next question. Does the interactive thread potentially introduce a data race when threading when re when reading from the grid? Do atomics magic happen behind the scenes? Ah, uh, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's on a it's a, it's threading. So it's on a different thread. So there's the potential for races, uh, just like anytime you have threads. Okay. So yeah, there's a, there's a potential for races. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the interactive thread is only reading it. So you're pretty much fine. And especially if it's just for something like kind of looking at something where it doesn't matter exactly what state you're looking at because you just want to get kind of a rough impression of what it looks like, uh, it won't really matter. So it, it's possible you might see like a half filled in grid or something, but when you're plotting it, you know, just looking at it, you won't notice. But uh, and but yes, yeah, since, since it only reads it, it's not really that much of a of a race. But yes, of course, there's a potential for for races because they're threads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, sure, everybody wants to know when is 1.9 going to be released. Oh yeah, that is that is a very very good and obvious question. Uh, it's uh, we don't know exactly. I think it's it's getting very very close now. It was. Um, it was, we've been done doing a lot of work stabilizing it uh, and making sure it works. We, I, I really don't like to release these things before I, you know, we're pretty sure it, uh, you know, everything works and every package works. Uh, so we're, we're working hard to stabilize it, um, but it should be quite soon now. Now, now I, we've probably been saying that for a while, but it's, it's really close now. I think maybe just a couple weeks away. Okay. Um, does 1.9 allow improved developer experience in IDEs, VS Code, like static analysis, et cetera? Uh, I know re recently there have been some good features in VS Code itself, I think, for doing, um, for, for uh, getting more like linting information and doing integrated profiling uh, in the IDE, but I'm, I'm not sure if those are uh, like 1.9 specific. I don't know if that's really new in, in 1.9 itself. Um, I, is there a way to see the number of interactive threads during runtime to be able to toggle the interactive stuff? Oh uh, yeah, you can you can get the number. Yeah, you can you can query for the number of of threads and the number of thread pools. There's yeah, there are functions for that. Um, how relocatable are the package images? Is it feasible to distribute them to other machines given some constraints? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, they're generally not relocatable uh, for a variety of reasons, but yeah, they're 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 really designed to work as a cache and not as like a deployment mechanism. So, for distributing stuff, uh, it's pretty much system images are more more likely to work still. Okay. Um, oh. What's the main advantage of moving sparse arrays out of the standard library? Um, I can see it, it's happening in the recent commits. Uh, I think, well, the, yeah, the, that's a good question. Uh, the, the main advantage is that uh, it allows it to be developed more quickly. So we can, uh, we can develop it as a separate package, release new versions very often, and you can uh, upgrade it independently of the, of the core system and standard libraries. Uh, that, that's the main advantage. Uh, and then also, of course, you don't have to uh, have it compiled and loaded and in your image if you're if you're not using it, which is another minor benefit. But yeah, generally, you want things factored out into separate packages. It gives a much better uh, release cadence and development workflow. So yeah, you, you don't want stuff uh, unnecessarily bundled together. Uh, will we eventually be able to add threads after launching Julia? Ah, also a good question. So actually, the the native threads feature basically lets you do that. So we we don't have an entry point right now that says launch new thread. Uh, but if you are uh, if you're running in C and you call pthread create, and then that thread calls into Julia uh, in with the mechanism that I just uh, talked about, then that will basically add a thread. So so yes, there is essentially the ability to to add new threads at runtime now, although there isn't a uh, easy Julia visible. Uh, API for it. But yeah, it does mean the number of threads, if uh, if you're in one of these environments, uh, can now change at, at runtime. So you might have to be careful if you have, uh, if some people had uh, package code that assumed the number of threads was fixed. Uh, so that does have to be uh, gradually fixed over time to not make that assumption anymore. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, this question is likely more about Julia Hub than Julia 1.9. Um, is it possible to use Julia Hub in a private Azure cloud setup um, due to corporate cybersecurity concerns? Uh, possibly, yes. It's not. That's. I'm not the best person to answer that question, but uh, I, some somebody is. I mean, Misha, do we know who's who's, who's the good person to answer? I, I will get. Some, I will get some follow up on that question for you. Yeah, so, we, that's so yeah. We that's definitely that. something we can. Yeah, we can. We can get back to you about. Yeah. Uh, oh, I will. I will address this one about. Yeah, static compiler does not support dynamic dispatch. Yes, yes. This, the static compiler .jl package is a very very cool hack, uh, but it is kind of a hack, which is why it's a, a package. It's not. It, and it's not built into the system. Uh, so it, it only handles a subset of the language. Uh, so it, while what it does is cool, it doesn't implement the whole language. So that's why we can't really, you know, put our stamp of approval on it. Uh, but we're, we're gonna get there, hopefully. We're kind of, uh, we're, we're, I'm approaching the problem from both directions. We've got, uh, you know, the base system images thing where the images are really big and unwieldy, but they support everything. And then you've got static compiler that can make small binaries, but it doesn't support the whole language. And I'm, we're kind of trying, we're working from both directions and you know, seeing, seeing which gets there first. Okay. Um, do you want me uh, is there a new, new LTS coming? So I guess, let's see, the last one was uh, 1.6. So maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the net, maybe 1.10 will be uh, an L LTS release, I think, possibly. So maybe, yeah, maybe. I don't think that's been officially decided yet, but yeah, that it might be. So maybe, yeah, in a year or so, yeah. Okay, there's there's a question that um, apologizes first, if it might be a, a noob question, but how easy, seamless is it to upgrade from one version of Julia to another? Um, uh, yeah, you... it's, it's, it's very easy. Uh, there's this... Uh, program Julia up. Uh, it's a Julia version manager uh, that people like to use for that. It makes it very easy. So I, I recommend that. Okay, great. Just going to take one more second, see if anybody else has anything. Uh, so I, this is, this is a question I don't have to pass to Jeff. We will, um, be we have we have a recording of the talk and if you're a registered attendee um and probably on monday you will get a uh, um a link to that recording that you can view um so yes there will be a replay available okay i think that's everything i thank everyone for joining us today jeff thank you for presenting to us and we look forward to seeing folks on future julia hub uh, webinars. Thank you all. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.